I'm not going to get too, too much into the whole theory and history over here. Um, because I'm just not going to. We're going to get into it a little bit more in lab when we're actually going to um, address what some of these concepts mean. But what I want you to know is that the main goal of PNF, which stands for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, it's a big mouthful, also developed by a uh, neurophysiologist and uh, PTs. So a lot of these treatment techniques were developed by PTs and originally were not super functional, which is kind of moved it towards more function-based. Um, but the main goal of, N of PNF is basically to restore balance of antagonistic muscles, okay? To balance antagonistic muscles by using diagonal movement patterns. I think it says it somewhere in down here. Main goal of reestablish ba balance of antagonists, okay? We want to reestablish the balance of antagonists, and we do that through the use of diagonal movement patterns. Very briefly, some of the stuff you know you've studied it in development, okay? Their history, it views normal development that proceeds in cervical, caudal, and proximal distal, okay, direction, and treatment kind of focuses on that, so they'll address head and neck and trunk first before shoulders and arms, okay? So again, you've seen a lot of these neurodevelopmental approaches, everything is first core and stability and addressing postural symmetry before we can do more distal stuff, it's the same, proximal stability over you know, distal mobility. So just like how babies develop, that's how we kind of want to work. <laughs> but there is also an understanding that not everything is linear. Okay, some skills can develop parallel. Um, so we might, if a patient can't stand very well or walk, it doesn't mean that we won't try stairs, which is a different task. So, um, where is it? It's here someplace too. So normal motor development proceeds in cervical, caudal, and proximal distal sequence, okay? Early motor behavior, reflex activity, like I said that before, right? We learn to integrate those reflexes and develop volitional movement over them. Sometimes we may use those reflexes if they reemerge to facilitate movement. Like I said, if a patient has reemergence of ATNR and weak triceps, maybe I'd have them turn their head to see if I can facilitate some elbow extension. Um, Interaction between movements of flexion and extension is necessary for normal functional movement. So right babies are born, okay, early motor behavior um, oscillates between extreme flexion and extension. They're in that physiological flexion, they're on their bellies, they're in that flexion, okay, they're on their back, they're more in extension. They kind of move between those patterns of flexion and extension. That happens to, for us, when we engage in functional tasks. Everything we do is either here or here in flexion. Right, or we extend to reach to things. So we, even as adults, move between those patterns of flexion and extension. And everything in this treatment, those diagonals that we're gonna move the patients through, address those components of moving between flexion and extension. Uh, here, normal motor development has an orderly sequence, but lacks a step-by-step -step quality overlapping, you know, can occur. So we used to think that if you couldn't walk, it's because you never crawled, and then therapists would make adults learn how to crawl so they could walk again. But now we know that doesn't always work like that, okay? Some kids skip the stage of crawling and go straight to walking. Things can overlap, and that's what I said before. If the patient has trouble walking, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't walk upstairs. So you'll see PTs who, even though the patient can't walk very well, would still try to do stairs. It's a different task, involves some different components, they might be, you know, developing at different, different times. All right, so let's get into the diagonals. Like I said, a lot of our movements, according to PNF, occur in those diagonal patterns. And when we do treatments with the patients, we want to move them through these diagonal patterns. We're going to focus mostly on the upper extremity. And at first, it sounds really random and, like, non, not related to anything in your life. But I'll talk about how these movements relate to some functional tasks. So those... Movements, there's four of them. It's D1 flexion, D1 extension, D2 flexion, D2 extension. The D stands for diagonal, okay? So D1 flexion is right here. All of you, do D1 flexion, please. Thank you very much. 
This is D1 flexion. You can read exactly what it says. Shoulder flexion and adduction, external rotation. Elbow flex, forearm supinated, wrist flex, finger flex. D1 flexion, D1 extension is down here. Okay? D1 flexion, D1 extension. Now we're only going to start dancing. D2 flexion, D2 extension. All right, when we think about that flexion and extension, okay, that confuses students why this is flexion too, but the shoulder is flexed, okay? So D1 flexion, D1 extension, D1 flexion, D2, sorry, flexion, D2 extension. My advice is if you can do it on yourself, you will know what the position is. That's why I'm making you do it. And always, if you remember it in this order, and believe me, I remember it from my neuro class here. Like, I, I remembered it years later. I was like, oh, yeah. Start with D1. If you know where D1 is, you can do everything in relation to that. Um, you can also Google uh, single ladies PNS, and there's lots of OTs and PT oh students who did <laughs> dance moves for this with the lower extremities cool. and stuff, because it's all about that. So now you're saying, okay, what the hell is this? What does this have to do with anything I do in my life? So I'll, I'll ask you a question. You do, what do you do every morning? Stretch. Open your car door, you get to the car. What do they do? Seat belt. My seatbelt, D1 flexion, D1 extension, there we go. This is why it's functional. That's that idea of crossing the midline. We do a lot of our functional tasks in this position. Of course, they're not going to be all like perfect, everything extended, right? We have to think functionally. It's not going to be necessarily the complete movement, right? But that's an example of something functional we do, right? Um, you know, when I vacuum the floor, clean the windows, clean the windows all the time, <laughs> by the way, right? All these movements, they're all in those diagonals. So there's different ways we can move in those diagonal movement patterns, that what they call distribution. That distribution can either be unilateral. What does that mean? One, one side. side. Yeah, one side. If you're like, let me finish the mic. <laughs> right? One hand doing that. Okay. It could be bilateral, symmetrical. That means both hands, both arms are doing the same thing. Okay. What's what am I in now? D1 mm -hmm. flexion. D1 extension. D2 flexion. To extension. Okay, so that's both arms are doing the same thing. So let's say, you know, here's the task I do. <laughs> okay, I start in what? What position is this? D1 D2 extension. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> or that. So arms down is always the uh, is extension. Okay, right, so I start both bilateral symmetrical D2 extension. Okay, and I go into. Take my shirt off and go into D2 flexion. Okay, so that's just an example of a functional task that involves that bilateral symmetrical. And then there's bilateral asymmetrical, okay? Bilateral asymmetrical, I'm putting my earrings in the morning in front of the mirror, okay? Uh, can I take this yeah. for a minute? I'm tying my shoes, my hands, okay? That's bilateral asymmetrical. So when I'm here, whether I'm you know braiding my hair, or tying my hair, or messing around with my earrings, what position is my left arm? D1 flexion, my right arm? Yeah, D2 flexion. Okay, so that's they're both in flexion, but one is D1, one is D2. And the same would be here, both in extension, one in D1 and one in D2. That's asymmetrical going to get into the lifting and chopping in a minute. Okay, and then bilateral reciprocal. Think about any kind of reciprocal movement you're doing, right? Walking is bilateral reciprocal. Working on the pulleys with the patient, that's bilateral reciprocal. Um, oftentimes, a lot of equipment, a lot of gym equipment seems to be bilateral. You know, the elliptical, that's bilateral reciprocal. If you're doing pulleys, you're working a lot of times with the pulleys. You work on those patterns of, you know, Flexion and extension with the hands, or if you do it this way, depending on what you're exercising. The techniques we'll talk about in lab, I just want to bring those <coughs> little pictures. All right, they're kind of funny. Um, the lower extremities, especially. 
If I sit patients like this all the time. <laughs> They're that flexible. <laughs> They're that flexible. They have really lots of core strength. They can hold both their legs up like that. <laughs> I can't even do that. Uh, okay, so symmetrical, both arms doing the same thing, right? Asymmetrical. They're both either in flexion or in extension, but they're each doing a different one, whether D1 or D2. Reciprocal, they're doing the opposite, okay? Reciprocal movement patterns. And in lab, you'll see some videos on how this is used therapeutically and treatment. treatment. We're gonna start talking about some treatment, treatment activities that facilitate that. And I do a ton of diagonals, because what happens when you reach diagonally? What are you doing with your arms, first Crossing of all? Crossing the middle. You're crossing the midline, and if we know a lot of times patients who had a stroke really avoid crossing the midline. They don't like that side. Okay, so you're crossing, and I already talked about how the eyes tend to follow the hand. What's happening with my trunk here? Rotation. Yeah, I'm getting some rotation. What did you say? It's getting stronger. Yeah, it's getting stronger because of that rotation, right? I'm rotating my trunk, but the other thing with that trunk rotation helps with that dissociation of movement between my pelvis and my trunk, right? I can transitional movements. In order to transition, you have to have some dissociation, right? We don't log roll out of bed and come out in one movement, right? It, it makes our movements difficult when we move in one unit. And you'll see, um, who had lab today? Poor girl. Yeah. Yeah. No, who had yesterday, sorry. Okay, those of you who had lab yesterday, you saw, what was his name? Tom was washing the car. Yes, right? And she tries to get him to reach to pick up the rag from the roof. And that's, by the way, what? Yes, <laughs> right? But you can see he doesn't want to go over there at all. And she like pushes him and he's really resisting and he's moving almost like one unit. There's no like dissociation of the trunk, right? Uh, even with the lady who was potting the plant, when she's reaching forward to the plant, you can see her whole body is moving. There's no dissociation. So all these things are really good to facilitate some of that dissociation of movement and help with those transitional movements and reaching. All right. So we talked about unilateral, lateral, symmetrical, bilateral, reciprocal, bilateral, asymmetrical. If you have a patient who has a flaccid upper extremity, let's say they're Brunstrom stage one, two, or three, and those who will have lab today, that will become clearer later on. Okay, so Brunstrom stage one, they're completely flaccid. Stage two, you said, Michael, before, they're starting to have movement. Stage three, where are they? Remember? Flexor yeah, they're getting that flexor synergy, right? They're starting to be inside that synergy, okay? So these patients have a hard time to volition, volitionally moving their hand, okay? So in order to engage them in those movements, in those diagonals, if they can't reach for the, on their own, they will use what we call the lift and chop. They will use their other hand, like we mentioned before, to help with that affected extremity to raise their arms, okay? So that's called lifting. So now I have my right hand is in D1 flexion, my left hand is in D2 flexion, yep, and then when they come down, my right hand is in D1 extension, my left hand is in D2 extension. Okay, so you're using them <laughs> one side of the body to help with the other one. It's called lift and chop, right? Because they're lifting and chopping okay. for all of you, you know, wood. Chompers out there who <laughs> actually think about holding that. That's a good exercise, though, right? For the, the PNF. But that's a bilateral asymmetrical, okay? Lift and chop usually refers to those patients who have to use one hand on the other to, in order to lift it and move it. And we might use that if the patients have them, you know, use the one hand to reach and complete a task. And you will see therapists using this term in practice. I've had, I've heard talk to patients, you know, in practice who would say, yeah, we did some lifting and chopping. And you are expected to know what they're talking about, you know. I don't really think that they actually want to chop some wood, right, in the clinic. Maybe, but um, usually that doesn't happen in acute care hospital setting. So, uh, all right, what questions do you have about PNF? The specific techniques, how to use it in practice, everything will be in lab next week. Any questions? Show me D1 flexion with unilateral. Okay, D1 flexion. D2 extension. Oh, I did trick you. D2 extension, okay. Um, bilateral symmetrical D2 flexion. You should, you should totally, yeah. You should make a little dance for yourself. Um, 
bilateral asymmetrical D2 and D, so well, D1 and D flexion, ah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> bilateral, asymmetrical, you're already prepared. That's not what I want to say, but who cares? Uh, bilateral, asymmetrical, D1 and 2 extension. Um, when you put a belt on in your pants, right? That's bilateral, symmetrical, D2 extension. So, so when you think about functional task, obviously it's not going to be the whole complete movement, but it's components of those diagonals that you engage in while you complete those functional tasks. <laughs> All right, any questions about this before we go on? No, you're good? Okay. Let's go over the case study. You're welcome, I'm a little late. No, I, the thing with the, like, those PDFs is they don't convert very well. They yeah. look funny and sometimes they change yeah. letters. So just pay attention if it's like an acronym. Yeah. It says PNF, but like, say PNE, because I think it's an E. Oh, I see. Yeah. So just like, don't go by completely. Yeah. Oh, you should go get tickets for that. I work Saturday. Did any one of you get a, get my hand out? Mine with the notes, flip it to the other side, see if there's my handwriting on it? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, all I see is. Thanks. I know, I saw that and I was like, ooh, and I was like, no. I'm sorry. I don't know, but I work at Murray, so like, so, yeah. I mean, you could come after, I guess, but if it's like, All right. by nine, then it doesn't yeah. anything, yeah. Okay. Let's go over this together, because some stuff will be, might be hard for you to read, just because of the handwriting and the shorthand. So we'll go over it, I'll read it out loud, then we'll go over a problem list, and we'll start developing some goals, okay? So the diagnosis, this is, by the way, an old Mercy Club Buffalo paper eval. They don't exist anymore, they're all actually on the computer. The problem is that when I tried to print out some more recent ones, because I had some really good patients, and I'm like, this would be fantastic for learning. Um, for some reason, this is, they have terrible electronic medical record system over there, and it's like 17 pages that it prints it. It's like really long, and it does like, you know, the ADL is here, the functional status is here. It's very difficult to read. It's like not user-friendly at all. So. For the purpose of learning, I said, let's stick to something that, I don't need to confuse you more, so let's stick to something that you can actually follow here and understand. Um, Leslie, on the other hand, she gave you last week a nice one from Macaulay. They have a nice, like, print out, their system is a little different, so. When you look at it, though, Karen, when you're working on the computer, is it more clear? Yeah, yeah, when you, yeah. When you look at it, it's fine. It's just how, like, the print option, how it comes out. It's okay. terrible. And it's like, a lot of facilities still want you to fax them papers, so I'm like, we went from one page, it's like 17, okay? So now it prints it out, it's like 17 pages. I'm like, really? How did that save paper? They don't want us to email it, they want us to fax it, so now I just printed in the file that I could have printed one page before. Oh, I do digress. <laughs> Let me tell you how I feel about electronic medical records. No, at least you can understand doctor's handwriting, so that's good. So the diagnosis. Um, rupture of the uh, AVM, there's no information here. It's a male, and I don't, I don't have the age but um, I'm assuming he was fairly young. Rupture of AVM with craniotomy. What's AVM? Anyone else? Anyone heard about that? Why did you say first of all that you think he's done that? Um, two reasons. First, because he lives with that. That doesn't mean anything, but usually AVM younger. I, I don't mean like young, he might be 50, oh. but I'm thinking not necessarily like in senior. like senior because okay. um, AVM is arterial venous malformation that sometimes has been like 19 year olds. It's basically, it's an aneurysm that you have, it's like a, it's like a um, congenital, congenital condition. You might not even know that you have it until one ruptures, and then you have a hemorrhag like a hemorrhagic stroke, you start bleeding, uh, and usually the treatment is to do a craniotomy. What's a craniotomy? <laughs> Kevin and Jenny talked about it in his lecture. Arterial Yep, they take a part yeah. of your skull Interior out. Venous what? malformation. It's <laughs> yes. Um, they take it because of the bleeding. There is a lot of increase in intracranial pressure. 
and then your, you know, everything starts pressing on the skull and it causes more widespread damage to the brain, that pressure. So they remove the piece of the skull. Oftentimes they even go in there and drain some of the fluid. Um, those patients usually, when you see them and you'll treat them, they will have a helmet. And I can tell you right now, don't ever transfer a patient who's fresh after a craniotomy without a helmet on their head because they're usually very involved and it is really scary to mobilize a patient when they have their brain basically unprotected. Okay, so usually they will have the helmet. Usually we say, until they get a helmet, I'm not getting this person out of bed. Okay, you do not want to risk that patient falling. Okay, even though their skin is intact, they always, like I always tell them, they're very fashionable, because right, especially now, these days, they have their head shaved. So I was like, oh, look at them. And then they have like a really nice big, like, scar, like stitches, right, throughout their head, and their skull is kind of, their head is, bent in a little bit. So it looks really weird, but they, you want to make sure that they're safe and that they're protected, that they have the helmet on before you move them. But normally you see that with younger patients, not with seniors. Um, so f prior level of function lives with dad, works as a steel worker, so we still know the person is employed. It's another kind of clue that gives, t tells me that they're not a senior. Um, prior level of function, they were uh, independent with ADLs. PTA, PTA is prior to admission. Uh, he drove. Bed and bath is upstairs, and he has a walk-in shower, okay? There are a couple, the rest of the rows, you see weight-bearing, that's if they have any weight-bearing precaution, you write it there. If they have any cardiac, any other precautions, you write it there. Um, ADL equipment, none, okay? They didn't have any ADL equipment. He was completely independent prior to admission, uh, and his goal is to get back to normal. What's that symbol? Um, a zero with a line through it. All right, so patient's functional status. Let's see, this is their FIM assessment. This is how he functioned. In his ADLs, grooming, he was a mod assist, bathing max assist, <coughs> upper extremity dressing, mod assist, lower extremity dressing, total assist. And you can see in the patient performs, it tells you exactly what they were able to do. Um, transfers, stand, pivot, sit, bed to chair, Toilet, all of those are total assist. And it says right under adaptive equipment actually says stand, pivot, sit. So they just stood him up and pivoted him and sat him down. Okay, probably my guess if he's a total, is that his post it was probably two people helped with that, but doesn't specify it. And then right next to the transfers on the patient performs, it says sit to supine, max assist, supine, sorry, sit to supine, mod assist, supine to sit, max assist. Okay, so bed mobility between mod to max, depending on whether they're getting into bed or getting out of bed. Why do you think sit to supine needs less help than getting up? Gravity. Yeah, because gravity helps. They probably need the mod assist just to help control his descent into the bed, otherwise they'll crash in there. Uh, so it's probably that. Um, and then to get up is a lot harder. You need to use a lot more of your strength. Range of motion. Upper extremity range of motion within right upper extremity within functional limits. Left upper extremity flaccid. So what side of the brain did he have the AVM? Right. Yeah, right side. Um, passive range of motion within functional limits. Right. Obviously he's flaccid. There's no active range of motion. Passively has full range of motion in that side. Flexor tone noted in left fingers. Do you remember how I told you? Uh, well, I don't have you for labs, but those who had lab with Leslie and those who will have lab, uh, who will have lab later. In Brunstrom, we talk about the arm and the hand. They can be different levels, right? This is an example that is probably Brunstrom stage one for the arm and stage two for the hand is starting to develop a little bit of flexion in that fingers, in those fingers. Um, lower extremities within functional limits bilaterally. Upper extremity, right upper extremity, that's strength, sorry. Upper extremity, right, five out of five throughout. Left upper extremity not tested, secondary to flaccidity. Obviously, he has no strength, okay? Uh, strength in the lower extremity, right hip, knee, and ankle, four out of five. Left hip, three minus out of five. Knee, three out of five. Ankle, three minus out of five. What does it tell you about his ability to maybe walk and stand? He's pretty weak. Yeah, he's pretty weak, right? He cannot move. He, only in the knee he can do fuller range of motion, but can't sustain it, right? The rest, he can't even move his hips and his ankle, full range of motion against gravity. Okay, so now imagine that leg needs to support an entire body weight. Balance, sitting, so static, sitting and dynamic sitting, max assist, 
leans to left depending on the activity. So he's a left hemi and he leans to left. Yeah, he might have, that might be pusher syndrome, right? We don't know, but he might have some pusher syndrome if he likes to lean to that side. Or it's so new and he's so weak that he's just like his body is collapsing in, in there. But that's something to think about. Um, standing, static, mod assist, dynamic, total assist. Okay, so he cannot stand dynamic. Tone, voluntary movement, flaccid left upper extremity, uh, left finger, sublex on left, on the left, sorry, one finger, so that was supposed to be, I don't know, sublux on left hand, noted. Sensation, left impaired for light and deep pressure. Uh, this patient perseverates, answers when, answered when wasn't being touched. Do you know what perseveration means? Can't, can't get past it, right? They perseverate on the same thing. So you might say, am I touching you? And you know, and you'll learn it when we do the sensory testing. So if the patient just perseverates and keeps answering, yes, 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 even though you stopped asking them along, they just keep answering the question. Uh, decreased localization of light touch, um, bilateral, more on left lower extremity. So that's the lower extremity. So cognitive and perception, A and O times three. Do you know what A and O stands for? Alert and oriented times three. What are the three things that we check that they're alert and oriented to? Do you know? Who, what, where? Who, what, where? <laughs> yeah. So, self, so, yep. Person, place, yeah. time, right? So, are, do they know who they are? Do they know where they are? Do they know the date? And sometimes we do it times four. We do the situation why you're here, why did you come here, what are you doing here? You know, they might not know that. Uh, problem solving scenarios one out of three. So we give them a scenario and they have to, you know, what number do you call in case of emergency? They say 911. In this case, they were correct or intact for 911. Uh, but you probably gave them two more. Um, right, left discrimination intact. Object identification. Two out of two, it looks like it. Questionable left neglect. Um, missed. Oh, questionable left and left missed two lines on line bisection test. Did Leslie talk about that in the stroke lecture? I know she did the clock. She showed you the clock in the house, you said, right? Um, another test we do is we give them a piece of paper that has lines all over it, and we ask them to just cross the lines out, cross them, draw a line in the middle. We put the patient the page right in midline, and very often you'll see that if they have left neglect, they'll just do the right side of the page and the whole left side of the page is blank. So it looks like, you know, he missed a few, missed, missed uh, lines on line dissection. Uh, patient lethargic during eval, needed cues for arousal and initiation. Um, visual acuity intact, difficulty crossing midline to left. Okay, so all these things I told you, why do we, this is what, we wanna do a lot of diagonals, we want them to reach here, because he doesn't like to be here. All right, so based on what you see here, let's start thinking about a problem list. And the nice thing about this is when we do our assessment, especially with the FIM scores and everywhere really you work, you have it all broken down to those different, you know, tasks. So when you write goals, you know what you're writing. So what's, what's a, give me a problem that he has. Okay. Okay, so what is it? What we call it, can't stand, can't sit. Just more general term. You write goals for it. You did the whole lab on it. Sitting and standing. Balance. <laughs> balance. <laughs> okay, so take me standing balance. Okay, also sitting, right? Yeah. With the um, problem solving being one out of three, would that mean like you need to be alert about his safety awareness? Mm -hmm. Yep. Depends on what the questions were. So it might be, <coughs> you know, decreased problem solving, and it might be decreased safety awareness. So we can write that though. Some, some people might just write de decreased cognition, but I think that's a really, really big term. 
right? We don't know uh, what aspect of cognition. Yeah. Um, decrease in ADL. Yes. Um, left upper extremity facility. Okay, so decrease left upper extremity tone. Maybe left upper extremity abnormal tone, right? James, did I see your hand up? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, what else with cognition? was impaired. Perseverating. Hmm? Okay, so perseverating. What else did he test that he said he did one out of? Yep, we put problem solving. The initiation phase. Oh, maybe I didn't read that one. <laughs> I skipped it. I think so. Cognitive perception, ANO times three. STM, decreased zero out of three. You know what STM stands for? Under cognition, short term memory. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I did, I skipped that when I read it. So, cognitive perception, there it says alert and oriented times three, short term memory. Mm -hmm. Deficit, zero out of three. So, you probably told him three, he or she, the therapist was. I'm assuming it's Matt, but I don't know. It actually, doesn't look like Matt's signature. He co signed it. Uh, <laughs> trying to see. So, they probably told him three words. And then said, repeat after me. The person repeated them. They say, all right, remember those. I'll ask them again in about a minute or two. And then they ask them again. They couldn't remember any of them. So that's usually our quick and dirty test. So you can also write decreased short-term memory. What else in the area of function? Function, right? Functional status. I said on the FIM, remember, we test all those ADLs, but we also assess what? What else is right under? Transfers. Transfers. <coughs> yes. Good. Decrease in transfers. So, now based on these problems, we want to come up with goals. Word of advice. Stick to goals that are easier to write, which are usually goals in the ADL and transfers. Because even if they have deficits in all those other areas, once you address dressing, you will also address sitting balance and sequencing and cognitive and visual and neglect. You'll address all those other problems through addressing the functional task. All right, generally the short-term goals, we do them for about one week. Okay, so let's think about an ADL that he needs to work on. Dressing. Dressing what? Upper body or lower body? Is he saying function on both? Mm -hmm. No. No. Yeah, he needs to work on both, but lower is much worse than this. You can write a goal for both. We usually do. All right, so which one do you want to start with? Lower. Lower? All right. So increase lower body dressing to what? You bump them one level up. Max. Yep, he's a total now, right? To max assist. You can finish this goal here. There is no need to add any more information after this because this is a functional goal. This is a goal that addresses an area of occupation or a level of independence in a functional task. All you need to write is increase lower body dressing to max assist. You have to pull the time frame. Well, it says one. It's by one week, patient will. I just write it up top and it applies to all the rest of the goals. Save yourself the writing. And by the way, when you do the Freeman planning class, I'm okay with you doing arrows up and down whenever you want to do it. It's okay. Save, save your hands gonna hurt after writing all those treatments. So, so stick. It's just get used to writing it like that. Everyone knows what it means. You see this. This is from a real patient. Okay, that's how we write in practice. All right. So increase lower body dressing. How about upper body dressing? Increase lower body dressing to meniscus. Is he a mod now? Yeah. yeah. All right, meniscus. What else? Give me another functional goal. Yeah, plenty of ideas in there. Grooming, meniscus. So what? Give me the goal. Increase gro grooming to meniscus. Yep. Isn't that easy? I'm gonna make you write a sitting balance goal. You see, it's not so easy. <laughs> Increase grooming to meniscus. All right, another one. One more. Yes. Increase transfer to max assist. 
Okay. I want to be, even though he's total on all of them, um, I tend to specify which type of transfer. So you want to pick one? Bed to chair. Bed to chair. To what? Massachusetts. And I like to do the arrow with the, you know, the two direction arrow, so it's bed to chair and chair to bed, both ways. Get it all. Good, let's do one more functional and then go to something that's more of a client factor. Right. Yeah, Fallon. Um, if you read bathing to Madison. Is he a max now? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. He's a max, yeah. Increase bathing. Okay, so do you see how you write your functional goals based on your problem list and what you got in the eval? I normally write basically a goal for each one of those areas of function that we address on the fin, and I also almost always write a balance goal. Okay, so for balance, what do we know about his sitting balance? Wow. One specifically, what does it say? How is it weighted? Sit this is fine as small. Not transfer, that's bed no. mobility. Sitting is mm -hmm. super, supervised? Is that, is that no, the S is just short for sitting in this case. It confused me too. So sitting, static. It looks like max. Yeah. So sitting is max assist for both static and dynamic. Okay. So. I'll start it for you. Increase static plus dynamic sitting balance to what? No. To mod assist. Any of you remember what it is on the good, fair, fair minus, four plus, four scale? Somewhere in the good. Fair minus is a mid assist. Good minus? Four. Four plus. Just because why not remember like 7,000 more scales, right? <laughs> All right, so increase static and dynamic sitting balance to mod assist, four plus. Can I leave the goal there? What do you think? No. No, why not? Because you made it sound like. What? Because you made it sound like we're not the leading goal. <laughs> because it was a leading question. So when we write goals that address a um, client factor or a performance skill, so client factor, range of motion, strength, yeah. Do you have to give like a functional reason why that you want to increase that? So like setting increase static balance so that they can tie their shoes or exactly. whatever. Exactly. Anything that is a client factor or performance skill, you have to tie to a functional task. But before I do that, he also wrote in the note that he leans to the left, right? So when you write a goal for sitting and standing balance, you want to describe a little bit more of the quality, and usually we also give a time frame, how long we want them to be able to sit. So usually I would write decrease sitting balance to mod assist at edge of bed. So where are they sitting? Times five minutes with no loss of balance. This is where goals get really, really tricky. So I give, I want to describe the quality of the movement. They can sit, okay, so they're sitting, but they're like this the whole time. That is not how I want my patients to sit. They're able to maintain their standing balance, but they're leaning to the left, right? So I want them to sit upright. So at edge of bed, times five minutes with, that's a C with the line, no LOB is loss of balance. And this is where the most important part of the goal gets, you get, is in order to. Okay, you have to write this. You have to tie this to a functional task. Okay, in order to participate in, let's say, Mike, you said lower body dressing. That is why I told you at the beginning, when you do the treatment plan in class, to the ADL goals. 
a lot easier to write. Because if you write a goal like this to me and you write half of the goal, I will take points off for it, okay? They're a lot harder because you always have to tie them to function. It would be the same if I was doing, um, you know, there's no range of motion here. Range of motion goal. If I say increase range of motion by 10 degrees, why? Who cares? And that's what the insurance company is going to say. Why are we working on increasing the range of motion by 10 degrees? What, is 10, what difference is 10 degrees going to make? So you're going to have to write, increase left upper extremity shoulder range of motion by 10 degrees in order to increase the ability to reach overhead, to complete grooming tasks, or whatever it is you want to tie it always to functional tasks. They're a lot more complicated. Um, what I would tell you completely to avoid when you get the treatment plan, do not write a goal for this. Those are hard. Again, you have to be, you guys learned Romba, right? Realistic, understandable, measurable, behavioral, achievable, right, all of that. It is very hard in order, you have to describe how you're measuring that neglect. So you're gonna have to say, you know, improve left neglect as evidenced by ability to attend to the left side of the environment during an ADL test 50% of the time. Or find items, yeah. Just out of curiosity, do PTs have to, like, the PT work with all the Do they have to tie what they do to a task too? It has changed in recent years. It didn't used to be like that. So with the move, it, yeah, but they would say in order to, you know, increase mobility or ambulation or gait, um, you know, generally, if I'm in the MRU or in the acute care, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't do range of motion goals at all unless I'm doing a splint or anything like that that's directly related. I only write ADL goals and then balance goals, and everything else is going to be worked on while I address those functional tasks. Uh, but that was a very hard transition for PTs. For OTs, they're like, yeah, sure, we always tie it to function anyway because this is what we do. And PTs had a very hard time learning how to tie their work to function because insurance companies were like, uh-huh, we're not paying for this unless you tell us why. Yeah. Are you giving us our in-class treatment plan? Like, are you giving us like this? And you're it would be like, like a, yeah, it would be similar to this. You'll have to come up with a problem list, and you'll have to come up with goals and then treatment.